All right, let's get started. Come and have a seat, please. And welcome to our Wednesday praise and prayer service. No, it's not. It's a regular Wednesday um, service, right? Regular. Um, just a few things before we get started. Um, I hope some of you got the email and the text from uh, Pastor Larry relative to the fasting this week. We started this week, and we're going to continue for a number of weeks. Uh, did, uh, did you, anybody get, not get the text? Everybody got the text? Nobody? Can you pass these out, Jenny? If you, if you didn't get the text, let me, uh, we have an out, we have uh, information for you. And um, it's a great document because it gives you a good picture of what uh, fasting is about and how you can proceed with it. Also, don't uh, forget that Sunday is Communion Sunday, Missionary Sunday, and there's also going to be, um, for some of you who are really uh, politically correct as far as your Christianese, it's pot blessing, not pot luck. Just so, whatever. Um, hmm. Next week um, it is praise and prayer service, and we're going to be continuing with the Disciples' Prayer, the last petition, which is going to be uh, lead us not into temptation. It's actually going to go over two different weeks, uh, two different months. So August, we'll do that first part of that particular um, portion of scripture. And then September, we're having a little bit of feedback. September, we're going to um, have a praise and testimony service. So I want to encourage you that particular Wednesday, I want you really to come with a testimony, a time for you to give thanks to God for what he's done in your life. Uh, if you have a verse that you want to share with the congregation, maybe an answered prayer, but it's a time for us to come together to uh, praise our God and to look at how God has worked in our lives. I think it's always good to, just like um, Israel did with putting the rocks in the river Remember that on Joshua for a reason, because God says, whenever you cross this, I want you to look at those rocks and remember all that God has done. And so please uh, be thinking about that, because we'd really love a lot of uh, participation. Uh, oh, <laughs> you can do a Milli Vanilli. Oh, yeah, well. Some of you guys know, don't know what Milli Vanilli is, but it doesn't matter. Um, no, you can sing. We, we love to hear you sing regardless, because... We're going to turn up the music as loud as we can. <laughs> <laughs> All the gray hairs, though. Anyway, um, we're, we're so uh, thankful you guys are here. We're going to do some worship. And then we're going to go continue our study in Genesis chapter 2. And um, we will see what God has. So, Father, we thank you for blessing us. God, what an incredible blessing it was this afternoon to have all that rain. So thankful, Father, for what you've done. We're grateful, Father, for your blessings. We're grateful, God, for your presence. We're grateful, Father, that you continue to work in our lives nonstop, 24-7. Your faithfulness, God, really overwhelms us. And we come tonight with thanksgiving. We want to bless your name. We want to remember the goodness of our God. We want to raise our voices in praise. And so, Father, receive these songs, God, with um, our hearts just being poured out to you. In Jesus' name, God, we pray. You know what? This first song, you got to stand up, I think. I really do. I think you need to. No, you must. You, you must. must. This is, this is the blood flowing <laughs> song, House of the Lord. We are here in the house of the Lord, and we have come to praise our God. Let's sing.
of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We're going to shout out Thank you, Father God. Thank you that we always have a place in your arms, in your presence. We thank you for this facility that we can come together and unite as one body and declare our love for you. But God, we thank you so much more that you reside inside of us and that we can come to you at any time with anything that we feel we need, we want, we are concerned about. And you care for us and you love us and you meet us where we are, God. We thank you for that. There, there is none like our God. <laughs> Thank you. 
There is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. Cause there is none like you. There is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. Cause there is none like you. such a powerful song about lifting our voices and shouting to God our praises. Shout to the Lord. It's one of my favorites and it just has a way of reaching into our hearts with praise and adoration.
but I don't know if uh, you can top that one, but I think we're going to. <laughs> There's another great song. It's been around for a while. Um, How Great Is Our God. And it's what a declaration it is of who God is. And uh, it should really cause us to really open up our voices and just sing to the Lord of his goodness and his greatness. Sing and sing with us. Name above all names. Thank you, Jesus. Worthy of all praise. You are so worthy, Lord. And my heart will sing how great is our God. How great.
a wretch I remember who I was I was lost, I was blind I was running out of time
want to thank you, Lord. That God, we can gather in the middle of the week and just, just honor you, Lord. Praise you, God. Thank you, Father, for all that you are and all that you do, Lord. Father, we just find you so worthy, Lord, of our praises, God. I just ask, God, that right now, Lord, that as we sing this next song, God, that we speak every word in truth, recognizing, God, just who you are, Father. You are you're marvelous, Lord. You're wonderful. You are worthy to be adored, God. We love you, Father. And we just sing this song, God, giving you all praise, all glory, all, all honor from our hearts, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
My vote is that the choir did good. So I had um, Jay. Is Jay back there? There was a slide she put up initially. Could you put that up if you find it? There you go. Any of you guys familiar with that? Yes. You know what you see? Anybody knows what they see? Yes? Yes? It took me like forever to find that out. But, but it, if you haven't seen it for you know, it's the first time, it, it's a little difficult to decipher that. It just looks like nothing. But... When you look more deeply, uh, you can see it. And uh, the reason I bring this up is because when we look at Scripture, um, it's very deep. And there's things we miss sometimes. And tonight, I think we're going to be looking at a few things that maybe some of you have missed, maybe not. But we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. So if you have your Bibles, easy find, open to the first book of the Bible, like second page. And you'll be there. So this is Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. There we go. And the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to, the, uh, to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and there he took one of the ribs and closed it up with his flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from the man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and they were both naked, the man and his wife were not ashamed. So, Father, we are grateful for your word as we meet periodically as a church, as a body of Christ. Your purpose, God, is to see us change, to take your word and to infuse it in our life and live it out. And so for this evening, God, such a familiar story. What a beautiful story you give us. We're praying, God, that as we look at this, there's things in our life that we need to listen carefully. Some things to continue in, some things to change, some things to stop immediately. We're grateful, Father, again, that you just relentlessly seek us. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, God, we pray. I think uh, a lot of you may be familiar with C.S. Lewis, his writings, and especially Aslan. So you remember Aslan? Um, Prince Caspian is one of the uh, books that was written. 
Um, there's a child by the name of Lucy. Remember that? Lucy. And she encounters Aslan. This is an encounter that she has with Aslan, this kind of Christ figure in the Narnia stories. And after not seeing him for a while, she, uh, finally, he comes to her. And she says, is Aslan, you're bigger. And Aslan says, that's because you're a little bit older, little one. And so she asks, um, not because you are. And she says, I'm not. But this is what he said. But every year you grow, you find me bigger. And I think that's so critical in our life as well, because as we walk with God over the years and understand him, the more we're going to mature in our faith, the bigger our God's going to be to us. And our vision of God becomes much more clear. We start to understand the greatness of our God. We, we learn how to rest in our God. We learn to grow in dependence completely in him. We learn to trust him. We learn to believe in God's word. Well, this was the desire, I believe, that God had for Adam in the garden, as we looked at last week. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 17. And if you remember, uh, some of you who were with us last time, it not only recorded how God uh, created Adam, but in the process, what God was doing, he was bringing Adam not only to existence, but imparting him some truths that he needed to know. Some very basic truths of how do we get along? What, what is it that's going to happen between you and me to make sure we live in harmony? And there were four ba basic truths that he taught him as we looked at last time. The very first truth he taught was intimacy. You remember that wonderful picture where you see that God is now forming man out of the dust of the earth and he basically kisses life into him. And I, I realize we don't want to, to, talk to, to put too much into the scripture that's not there. I realize that. But I want you to picture, get back into the garden like we talked last time and just kind of get an idea of what's going on there and seeing this incredible picture of God creating man. First and foremost, what God wants in your life is intimacy. First and foremost. He forms you. He's the master craftsman. He forms you out of dust to the earth. That's really a picture of all the details of your life. And then he breathes life into you, that incredible closeness that God has. Well, the second thing we looked at was not only intimacy, was the idea that God wants you to reverence your God. Very important. You remember we looked at verse 9 and 10, 8, 9, and 10, where God takes the man. It says he takes him and he places him in the garden. An incredible picture that God says, I have rulership over you and I can move you and place you wherever I want to place you. And then he causes, it says, the trees to come out of the ground. And you can imagine Adam, this brand new creation, watching God do these things. He must have been in incredible awe of God, the whole idea of awe, the reverence of God. And it's that fine balance we need in our life that we talked about last week. You not only have intimacy with your God, that Father Abba relationship, but it's also the God in heaven. Remember when Jesus taught in the disciples' prayer? Our Father, what? Who art in heaven, right? That fine balance. You can't bring God too far down to our level, but you also don't want to move him so far where you can't reach him. But it's those two fine things that we balance in our life to understand our relationship with God. And so we... See here that first it's intimacy. Then he says, you need to understand the reverence. But then he takes him again. He takes him and he puts him in the garden to work. And we talked about it in a paradise. And it was an incredible place that he had everything he needed. God says, you need to know that you're not here just to escape. <laughs> you're here to serve me. The importance of servanthood. God says, in light of all that I'm going to give you, you have purpose in your life here on earth. And God has given that same thing to us, by the way. Wherever God has put you, in whatever realm it is, and there's so many of you here that are in all kinds of realms in your life, right? Different professions, different places God has put us. God says that's exactly where I placed you for a purpose. It could be for a little while. It could be for a long while. But God says this is where I'm putting you because I want you to serve me in this particular locale right now. That is your area of servant put for God. So we're to... Have intimacy with God, God says. But you also need to awe, ah, the reverence of God, and also the servanthood. We're here to serve God. 
But then the very last thing he does, he tells him, you, you need to understand very clearly that in light of all that I'm going to give you, you're going to have to make choices. You're going to have to be accountable for your choices. And you guys have heard more than once, you can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. <laughs> and we're going to talk about this whole idea of what God told Adam in just a few minutes, but we kind of wrap this whole thing up in that Adam was to understand the significance of accountability. We wrap this all up because this is very, very similar to the first and foremost commandment. If you remember what Jesus said when they asked him, the lawyers asked him, what is the first and foremost commandment? And there were a bunch of them, right? The Jews had, what, 630 or 660? I don't know what it was, a bunch of commandments. Jesus goes straight to the top, and this is what he says. First and foremost commandment is to love your God with what? All your heart, listen, soul, strength, and mind. Intimacy, reverence, strength, and mind, those things. And I think I love this because you look at what, what was in Genesis is the very thing that runs through the whole scripture. This is all that God wants. This is how you get along with God, these four things. If you can keep these things in balance, you're going to have a wonderful relationship with God. But God is not done with Adam. Because what, I, what he's doing right now, and you need to understand, there's more to the first commandment than I just said, right? There's a little, a next part to it, remember? The next part to it. And the second is like the first, what is it? To love your what? Your neighbor as yourself. He's saying these things are connected. Listen, a man who knows God intimately would better know how to love his wife intimately. A man who comes under the authority of God is, not, is a man who's not going to demand submission from his wife. A man who serves God is going to better understand his role in serving his family. And a man who obeys God is going to bring a sense of stability and peace to his family. They transfer. It's not just be this way. It's this way as well. He said, you need to know this one first, and you're going to transfer that this way. Well, the message, again, God had for Adam is, again, the same one that runs through Scripture. Get things right with God first so you can get things right with others. So now in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 22, God now introduces the other who's going to come and help him fulfill his purposes because we looked at last week in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. There are some purposes that God had laid out for Adam. But Adam now is going to love his, learn how to love his neighbor as he loves himself. It's an incredible story. So something unique happens in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Up to this point in the creation story, six times God declared good, right? As you go through the creation story, he creates, he says, this is good. And then in the serenity of the garden, in the serenity of the garden of Eden, it's broken with a sound like that of a trumpet alerting a soldier to danger. And God says, it is not good. I was thinking about this and thinking, what did the, it must have made the angels stop in their tracks, don't you think? Like they said, say what? <laughs> it's like, what do you mean it's not good? Because <laughs> everything and the angels knew other than Satan was, it was all good. But this is the first time in the Bible, God says something is not good. What is not good? That's the whole question, right? What's not good? It is not good for man to be alone. Now, wives know this very well. You don't leave your husbands too, too long. They'll get themselves in a mess. <laughs> what he's saying here, not good in man's aloneness. That's the way it's translated. Alone, Adam could not fulfill his purposes, as we looked at in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. What was his purpose? to reflect the image of God. God created him in his image, both male and female. So he's only half the image, right? <laughs> right? So he needed his partner to fully express the image of God, to reproduce. Can't do it yourself, man. <laughs> you need a partner to reproduce and to rule over the earth. He needed someone to come alongside him and help him do what God had told him to do. Here's the question. I want you to think through carefully. Was Adam aware of his aloneness? Think about this real, this for a moment. Was Adam aware of his aloneness? Now think about it. He lived in paradise, 
in a perfect ecological system. No mortgage, no taxes, no smog, no traffic lights, no lawyers. Yay. Um, hope there's no lawyers here. Um, no need for doctors. Great supply of food. Great job. He walked with his God in the cool of the day. I honestly believe that Adam thought he was complete, and that is still the problem that many men have. <laughs> men have a problem believing they can handle things on their own. We'll, we'll admit it. In their mind, uh, the need for help diminishes their manhood sometimes. They think that. The medical term is macho man mentality, <laughs> at least in northern New Mexico. I can't rely on this list. I ain't got time for this. Uh, a list of why men are proud of themselves and why they think they're complete. Why do they think they're complete? Because a five-day trip only requires one suitcase. <laughs> they think they're complete because they know how to fix stuff. They're complete because we know how to open jars. <laughs> we think we're complete because we can go to the bathroom without a support group. <laughs> what is it with you ladies? <laughs> Entourage. <laughs> we can sit quietly and watch a game with a friend without thinking about them <laughs> or if they're mad at me. Uh, we can drop by and see a friend without bringing a gift. Christmas shopping could be accomplished for 25 people on the day before Christmas in 45 minutes. That's, that's, <laughs> uh, that's why we think we're complete. <laughs> Can I tell you what I think? Of course, my thoughts are not all that important, but I'll just give you my opinion. <laughs> At this point, I don't think that Adam had any more idea of being alone than what he knew, what he understood it meant to die. When he added the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, sin would result um, in physical death, we know that. And, and so when you read that passage, in the day you eat of the, knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. You need to think beyond the physical death. That that did happen, by the way. But more important, more significant than that, is the separation from God. God says, it's never good for you to be separated from me. Ever to be separated. So theoretically, I think Adam had agreed with God when the commandment went out, just like when you tell your children, don't touch the stove. <laughs> they go, sure, Dad, uh, I'm not going to touch the stove. But Adam needed to know, listen, he needed to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what it meant to be alone and what it meant to be separated from God. So here's where God helps him understand. So for, to fulfill God's purposes, to reflect his image, to reproduce, to replenish the earth, to rule over and subdue it, Adam needed someone like himself. So God addresses a little more than that. God addresses man's need for, listen, fellowship, for fellowship. God created humans to have fellowship with him, and Adam needed another one like himself. So the need for fellowship is built into man's DNA. Man is made in the image of God. And God introduced himself in plurality, as we saw in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He says, let us make man in what? Our image, the plurality, speaking basically of the Trinity, which indicates again that man is going to be made to enjoy relationship with God as God himself enjoys relationship. Dr. L. Kramer said this, man is the only species that cannot survive alone. The ancient Jews were a little bit more uh, in your face about this. They said this, whoever has no wife exists without goodness, without a helpmeet, without joy, without blessing, without atonement, without well-being, without full life. Indeed, such one reduces the presentation of divine image on earth. And they were pretty uh, in your face about the idea of having a partner in your life, a helpmeet. Does that mean it's bad to be single? Heavens, no. Never. It's not what the religious leaders thought, but it's important we know what the Bible says. And the Bible never condemns singleness or demeans those who are single. Marriage was designed as the foundational building block of society. 
But God works through and in those who are single. We know this because we've seen incredible work through the scripture of single people, right? Daniel was one of them. What an incredible work that he did. We see it with Paul. We see it with others. Well, the solution to a man's loneliness, this is what God says, I want to make a helper suitable for him. And there are three things in this statement that we need our attention. First of all, I want you to see this. It's God who decided what Adam needed. See that? He says, I'll make him a helper. And don't dismiss the fact that God never asked Adam for his opinion. He didn't say, Adam, what do you want? God says, no, I know you inside and out. I put you together. I know what you need. Wouldn't that be different when looking for a spouse? Instead of going hunting for them? To just say, God, you know what I need. I'm going to wait on you and you bring me that person. I'll be alert to what you're doing. But I'm going to wait on you. Because you know what I need. Because you put me together piece by piece. I think that if God had asked Adam what he thought, he'd probably say, a truck, (laughs) a golf course, a TV with a remote, a big screen. But God made Adam and he knew what Adam needed. How many men have determined what they needed in a spouse before consulting God to find out? Not a good choice. Well, Adam's need was not a truck, it's not a golf course, it's not a TV. God determined Adam needed to help meet. And unfortunately, this word help meet or helper often is misunderstood as maid, condescending, demeaning view of women. It's unfortunate, isn't it? Our language sometimes doesn't translate in English to what it really meant in Hebrew. This is an attitude that developed early in males. (laughs) <laughs> like this young boy named Alan. He is 10 years of age, and he has asked, how do you decide who to marry? This is what he says. You've, you've got to find someone who likes the same stuff you like. If you like sports, she should like it that you like sports, and she should keep the chips coming constantly. <laughs> 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 to appreciate what God did for Adam is really to understand what the meaning of the word is. It's easier, and I'm not even going to bother with the second one, kandego. It's just an interesting word. It's two words. Easier is often translated help, but it really has a much deeper meaning than help. I love the definition. It means to rescue or to save. To rescue or to save. It's the same word that's used in Psalm 46, 1, where it says, God is our refuge and our strength, the very present, because it says help and need. The same word, help and need. I'll tell you what, men need help. <laughs> We're counseling a young couple that's going to get married in August. And uh, I look at him as we Skype. He's got his old T-shirt on, you know. <laughs> He's living, uh, you know, on his own and... Asking, how is it going with the food? You know, macaroni and cheese is good. (laughs) Isn't it wonderful that God brings a a helper in our life to help us with all that stuff? Men men need really, they really, really do need a lot of help. The other term, meat, is translated meat for or fit for or exactly corresponding to a complement. You know, it's really unfortunate that when people get married, They think they're in competition. (laughs) It's it's the wrong C word. It's a compliment. God has given you a compliment because you don't have it all together. Men don't and women don't either. And God said, the things that you're lacking, I'm going to fulfill with this other person. So in the context of the passage, it means to supply something that is critically lacking that will come alongside and bring strength and rescue. Man, what a deal. That's a wonderful thing that God did for man. Adam needed a helper because the brother needed help. <laughs> he was deficient in himself to carry out God's plan. And, and you ladies who are married soon find out after the wedding, the boy needs help. <laughs> he, can get, he needs all the help he can get. Because a man needs a woman because he's not as good as he thinks. 
Suitable does not mean she'll do, by the way. Adam's helper was not a generic helper for Adam, but he's one that was custom built by God. Should not to be Adam's competition again, but his complement. Someone with a different view. I, I, I so almost uh, laugh out loud when these young couples were counseling. They say, we're, we're so much alike. We're just so alike. I said, if you're so alike, one of you is not needed. <laughs> True? You don't, you don't need the other ones. You're so alike. It only takes about a week to find out they're not so alike, right? <laughs> Doesn't, that doesn't take long at all. Or we're perfect for each other. No, you're not. <laughs> you're definitely not. You'll find that out too. You know, when um, God calls a woman into the life of a, her husband, he, he's never going to ask women to give up her knowledge or intellect or abilities or skill. He's calling her to assist a man in his calling. The wife is to come under his mission. One of the uh, verses, there's not many verses that a lot of men in the church can, can, uh, <laughs> can tell you from the scripture, but they know one when it comes to marriage. You guys know what it is? Ephesians 5.22. Wives, what? Submit to your husbands. <laughs> they don't even read the whole thing. They don't read the prefer. They don't read the context. They don't read anything. They just know that one verse is really kind of tattooed on their head. You guys know what the word submission means? It's so simple. It's so simple. We get so complicated with this stuff. You know what the word sub means, right? What is it? What do you mean? Come under, right? Like submarine. Submarine, right? It means a ship that goes under the water. So what do you think submission means? To come under the mission of your husband. Pretty simple. Don't you think? Don't you think? So if you're going to get married, you better find out what the mission of your husband is. And are you willing to come under that mission? And you better examine the mission of your husband to find out which direction he's going and who is he walking with. If you say, man, this guy is walking with the Lord. God's blessing his life. That's the mission I want to come under. Pretty simple. We don't have to complicate it. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of uh, the presentation of the need. But here's the need realized. How's God going to do it? Okay, that, that's the big picture. Well, at this point, Adam doesn't know what he needs. So how is Adam going to realize his need in his life? God does it in two creative ways. First, he's going to expose the need in Adam's life, listen, externally. And then he's going to expose the need internally. And here's, what's God go here's what God's going to do. God is going to develop a void in Adam's life that only he can fill. So let's see how he does it externally. Verse 19 and 20. Here's what it says. God brings the animals to Adam in order to name them. Now, you remember this kind of scenario in chapter 7, 8 of Genesis? Where Moses gets off the Moses, <laughs> Noah gets off the ark. Remember that? And God brings the animals. Remember that? Two by two. Remember that? Okay. It's, it's kind of a similar situation. What is significant about naming something? He's going to name the animal. What is significant about naming something? There, there's a significance to it. You know what it's called? Authority. Authority. So when we had our babies. As much as we had relationship with our neighbor as friends, there's no way our neighbor would come into our house and say, let me tell you what you're going to name your baby. <laughs> I go, I don't think so. You need to go back to your house. <laughs> because babies belong to me. And I had the authority. God's given me the authority to name that baby because I have authority to do that. And not only does naming something express authority, it also expresses function function. That's like in Scripture when people name their children in Scripture, like Jacob, the wrestler. <laughs> There's a reason he was named the way he was named, right? It described who he was. 
Adam begins naming the animals. And I can imagine that God brings all the animals up. I don't know if it was alphabetical with Mr. Aardvark, Mr. But listen, Mr. and Mrs. Aardvark. Mr. and Mrs. Aardvark. Mr. and Mrs. Bear. Mr. and Mrs. Cat, Mr. and Mrs. Dog. You get the picture. Two by two, male and female, male. Uh, I mean, all these. Parading before him, naming all the animals, naming them for their function. He named a horse a horse because a horse is a horse, of course, because his name is Mr. Ed. <laughs> now, you youngins don't know anything about that, and that's okay. This was an incredible scholarly test, by the way. Adam was incredibly intelligent, probably more than anyone who has ever lived, because he was not tainted by sin. So here is uh, Mr. Adam. Who knows how long it took? But he's watching this, and the boy is finally getting it. They have a partner in what? I don't. Something's missing. You know what God told him? He said, look, I want you to look into what I've created for you. And I'm going to have you come and I'm going to name you all this. I'm going to have you name all this stuff. And then I want you to find out, does it fill the void in your life? Does it fill you? Does it satisfy you? Is it going to complete you? You know what that sounds like to me? A testimony. True? When people come up and they say, let me give you my testimony, you know what they're doing? They're naming their animals. I tried this, and I tried that, and I tried that, but it didn't fit until I came to Christ. That fit. God has just placed a void in Adam's life that only God can fill. What an incredible picture of what God is doing in his life and in our life as well until we come to the only one who can complete us, the person of Christ. So Adam begins to feel alone, and you know a man is ready to marry ladies when he feels alone without you. When he says, says I can't, be what I'm supposed to be unless you are there to be there for me and with me. I need you in my life. Or you can borrow the, uh, the phrase from Jerry Maguire, you complete me. So he exposes the need externally. Adam says, nothing out there is going to fulfill what I need in my life. But he does it differently now by exposing it internally. God causes an ache in Adam's side. As Adam looks at his environment, he realizes the things of this world are not going to satisfy him in his aloneness. So now God helps Adam understand the pain of the sin of separation. God told him it's not good to be separated, right? Remember that? Now God's going to teach him the pain of separation by removing something from his side. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. When you read that, it's a passage that many parents would like to see God do that with their teenagers until their, when their hormones awaken and wake them up, God, when they're about 26. <laughs> so God places man under an anesthesia. Now, I'd imagine that most of you have gone through surgery. A lot of you have general anesthesia. What's general anesthesia like? Count backwards from 100. <laughs> you get to 99, out. And I don't know how you guys felt about anesthesia, but there was nothing. It was like time, time was in suspension until you woke up. And, and I had no idea how long I was under. They, they get your body functions as far down as they can to death-like. Death-like. You know, they get you way down there. So they can do what they need to do. So Adam is now in a death-like sleep. 
Does that remind you of anything? Yes, it does. It should. It has incredible significance symbolically. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and he did what? He gave himself up for her. He died for her. Can you picture this? Adam is in a death-like sleep. And God is going to take something from his side. You remember the scripture talking about the piercing of Jesus out on the cross? And out of that piercing, the bride came. Then God took one of his ribs and he closed up at that place. This idea of a rib, you guys have heard that. Well, the men have one less rib. No, that's, forget that. That's not it. The better translation is side, flesh. And what God did was not take just a rib, but he took flesh and bone. And that is why, that is why, when Adam sees his wife Eve, he says, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Why did, why did, you know, there's a question, why did God even create a woman? You know why God created a woman? Here's why. Because he looked at a man, he says, I can do better than that. <laughs> so you ladies, hang on to that. I know, this is, I love this. And I think Pastor John has quoted this. Matthew, Hen, uh, Matthew Henry wrote this. Woman was not taken from man's head to be above him. She was not taken from man's feet to be walked on by him. She was taken from his side to be his equal, close to his heart, to be beloved and protected by him. What a great quote. It's a beautiful quote. What a wonderful story. It can be kind of confusing for some, scary for children when they hear this. Like the little boy who was in Sunday school and heard this story for the first time. So he comes home, he had a pain on his side, and he tells his mom, I think I'm going to have a wife. <laughs> <laughs> So when God um, made man, and it's really interesting the way this whole thing uh, unveils, he, he used dirt and he breathed upon, upon it. But look what happens here. When he creates woman, he makes her out of a relationship. Are we different? Are men and women different? I hope you know that they are. I hope, I hope you know we're so almost drastically different. And it happens from the earliest ages. You ever been to kindergarten and watched the kids playing outside? You know, what are the boys doing? The little boys, what are they doing? They're usually punching each other, right? Or running like crazy, or playing in the dirt, making noises, or shooting each other with, you know, their fingers. <laughs> and I, well, things have changed, but you know what I mean. What are little girls doing? You know what they're doing? They're sitting, they're talking. They're thinking princess-like thoughts. <laughs> You know, all this stuff is so significant. We do premarital counseling because all this has to do, all of this has to do with communication. It is so significant. Now, if you don't know how you're put together, your communication is going to be really bad. <laughs> because men, if they don't understand, if they can't learn to speak woman, there's a real problem. And by the way, the hardest language to learn is woman. <laughs> it's a tough one. It's tough. What's the greatest word when you get married? You know what the greatest word is when you get married? Adjust. That's <laughs> the greatest word. So let's look at how the need, was, the, the need was met. Look at verses 22 through 25. And we're going to see Adam's need met. And what we're going to see in this passage is really the first wedding. I love this, this passage. It's just a beautiful passage. The first wedding ceremony, and don't miss the sequence. Don't miss the sequence. Before God brings a woman to the man, God prepared the man in his relationship with him. Don't miss the sequence. I can't emphasize enough for you who have young people. If you have a daughter, make sure you find out who this man is. Make sure you know who he is. Find out his walk with the Lord. Find out who his friends are. Find out his commitment. It is so, so significant but before God brings a woman to man, he prepares a man for his wife by developing this relationship. So here's the ceremony, verses 22b. I love this. And the Lord, look what it says. The Lord brought 
her to the man. See, God created this woman in, in great detail, a little curve here, a little curve there, to make sure Adam would notice her. And he did. But listen carefully. Eve doesn't know anything about men. All she knows is she trusts God of what he's going to do. That's it. She didn't do all research. She didn't go to the library and find out, what is a man? <laughs> but she did know God. And she trusted God. God uh, didn't bring the woman to the man and say, go ahead and live together and see if it works out. See if you're compatible. Or as long as you love him or her, it's okay to live with her. And God did not ask Adam if she was acceptable. At this point, before the fall, listen, Adam fully trusted in God's goodness to bless him. All he knew is that God is a good God. That's all he knew, that God's going to bless me. I don't know what, what all this is about, but all I know is God is good, and I trust him. And don't miss again the sequence that unveils in this wedding as it takes place. First, God prepares again the man spiritually. Then God, bring, then God brings the woman to the that's usually setting people up for failure, by the way. There's a difference between dating and um, courting. We don't have time to get into that, but there's a real difference. But this whole idea of dating and getting involved with a person, especially physically, sets you up for failure. There's um, something missing in this relationship, dating. How can you ever find out if someone is compatible with you or yours unless you date them. You don't have to. Well, this is the first wedding. It's the first garden wedding, by the way. <laughs> garden weddings are a big thing, but this is the first one. Just as in a traditional wedding where the dazed groom views his bride and her father approaches down the aisle hand in hand with his wife. Adam uh, is in this deep sleep, and he opens his eyes and sees God bringing his wife to him. You know what's taking place here, which is so significant in marriages as well today? What you're seeing here is a transfer in authority. God is saying, she belongs to me. I'm going to transfer that authority to you, and you better bring her back in better condition than you found her. God holds men accountable for their wives. We can't be accountable for absolutely everything, but there's a lot of stuff God's going to hold us accountable for. God is giving Adam the woman, but with a the stipulation, with authority comes accountability. And when a woman marries, a father transfers his authority and protection over the husband. That's when we uh, also speak to young people before they get married. Love your in-laws, but there is a boundary around your marriage. There's a place that no one should enter, not even your mom and dad. There's no discussion with God why he brought who he brought into their lives. Adam received his wife based on belief that God is a good God and would never bring bad things into his life. Challenges, yes, but not <laughs> bad things. And when Adam sees his wife for the first time, you can imagine this guy has, has got an empty space in his heart right now. He's got a void here. But he wakes up and he sees her. And what he says is, whoa, man. <laughs> well, he didn't say that. But he said this. He said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Doesn't that just do something for you ladies? <laughs> Sweet nothings. <laughs> you know what? We look at that and we don't understand it. That's the problem. That's poetry. That's incredible poetry. Some people said it was the first song that was ever sang, other than the angels singing. A translation is this. You are perfect for me. You do complete me. 
Someone said, uh, man is incomplete until he's married and then he's finished. <laughs> You'll get it later. Uh, so now, I want you to look at this. Adam now is literally beside himself. <laughs> Think about it. His side, well, we don't have time to go into that. Don't you think it'd be great to be able to see the look on Adam's face? Don't you think it'd be one? You know what? One of the great things about marrying people, it's wonderful when the, wife, the bride comes in. And sometimes she's crying and you know, whatever is going on. I look at the groom. And I'll tell you what, we've had so many incredible experiences with grooms when they first see their wife. Some of them start crying. We've had grooms that just start weeping when they see her. Like, like, they've seen, like they saw her for the first time. Um, some of them are faint. <laughs> so we've had some <laughs> actually faint. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's all kinds of responses. But, but Adam here proclaims, this is what he says, she's part of me. Listen, she's part of me. I want her back where she belongs. Close to what? My side. What a, what a beautiful picture. Close to my heart. God's teaching Adam, listen, here it is. God's teaching Adam, the second part of the commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself, as part of him. Love your neighbor as yourself. Ephesians says this, so men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. For Adam, to get his rib back, he had to take hold of Eve, make her part of his life. And retrieving the rib he lost means he got another half, which he didn't previously have. Adam gets his rib and part of her rib too. So marriage brings you a bonus. <laughs> you are but some of what you are. You are more. Well, if Eve was going to fully understand what makes her her, 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 she needed to merge with Adam because half of what makes her her is part of what makes him him. <laughs> well, let's not get into that. Anyway, they come together. And then he does something very interesting. He names her, really? Do you remember we talked about naming a while ago? Remember what we named? He names her. Why does he name her? You know why he names her? God gave him authority as husband over that family. Just as his authority. His name is Ish. His name is, her name is Isha. Isha. That word um, can be translated, you know, male and female, however you want to. But part of it is soft. It means soft. Isha. She was soft. He's not naming her like a pet, believe me. But the whole picture of, again, authority that God has given him over his family. The lesson's complete. God not only presented to Adam a wonderful gift to complete him and bring him a companion, but in the process, I really believe that Adam, in a very tangible way, he now knows, he now knows what it means to be alone what that term is. And he also knows what it means to be separated. And God told him early on, don't eat of the tree because in that day, you're going to be separated from me and you're going to be alone. And you're never going to want that. He had to learn something tangible in his life. And God does that in our life as well. Well, here the need is confirmed. The highlight of the wedding as you know, it's not the dress, it's not the flowers, it's not the decorations, it's not the music. By the way, I know that so many weddings, it takes a year to plan, right? A year. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> my, my daughter, Michelle, decided to get married, and some, some things happened, very wonderful things happened. Uh, they decided they need to get married right away. It wasn't pregnancy, because she's 50, <laughs> And we planned a wedding in two weeks. It was a wonderful wedding. Oh, my, one of the better weddings we've ever had. It's not about the flowers. It's not about the music. 
It's about two people coming together and making a commitment before God. It's the words that are exchanged. It's the commitment of promise. It's a vow that is made. What's going to hold your marriage together? Well, we love each other so much. No, you don't. You love yourself a lot. And you may love the partner some. <laughs> love will never hold your marriage together, ever. Because your love goes like this. Up and down and up and down. You don't want to hold your marriage together? Your vow, your commitment. What holds your commitment to Christ? Your vow. It's <laughs> When you come and you understand the scripture and the gospel and you say, I'm going to make a vow to you, God, I believe. That's what holds you. It's not your, it's not your emotion with God. Your, mo your love for God goes up and down. That's not going to hold you with him. And you have heard these vows before. Oh, my goodness. They say something like this. You've heard these before. I promise to honor, cherish, protect, You've forsaken all others, holding only you from this day forward, for, <laughs> for better or worse, for richer or poorer, for sickness and health, from this day until death do we part. Aren't they just beautiful words? Someone was sharing with me this last week that their grandma was telling them as they're going up the aisle. He says, Mijita, northern New Mexico, Mijita, make sure you understand that marriage is for better or worse. <laughs> better. <laughs> And sometimes it's better. <laughs> you know, when we're doing a wedding, when I'm doing a wedding, I stop right here with this vow. And I tell them, listen up. Get everything else out of your mind right now. And you best listen to the words you're saying. You're making a vow. Listen to these words. They're, they're incredible words. You're making this not only before God, you're making it before these people here. And by the way, when you go to a wedding, your responsibility is to hold those, that couple accountable, by the way. That's, that's, your, that's your responsibility. It's not to go get cake. <laughs> it's to hold, hold them responsible that when they start to falter, you go, uh-uh, uh-uh. I was there, and I heard what you said. Right? And the same thing with people in their walk with Christ, by the way. Holding them accountable, Right? No, you told me you made a commitment to Christ. What are you doing backsliding? Uh-uh, no. <laughs> Get back on track, right? Get back on track. Now, m many of us have entered into a contract. I, I assume that all of you here entered into a contract at some time or another, right? A house, a car, whatever it is, an agreement between two parties on a certain issue. Stipulations are given upon the agreement. It's ratified by your s signatures. I remember there's like two or three pages. Oh, my goodness. You see what you have to sign today? Like page after page. You know why they do that? Because they don't trust you. That's why you have to sign so many things. Legally, be, be, You're legally bound to this stipulation of the contract. With other relationships, you don't like the agreement. You know what you can do? You can get out of it for the most part. You can walk away. You can't make the payment of the car, break the commitment, don't like the college you pick, drop out. But God says in marriage, listen carefully, there's no back door. There's no escape clause. It's not a commit. It's a commitment for life. Some people think about marriage this way. It was an ideal. Now it's an ordeal. Now I want a new deal. That's not the way it works. Malachi 2.14 describes marriage this way. It says, taking a wife as a companion. Listen to what it says. And the marriage as a covenant. Your marriage is a covenant. A covenant speaks of faithfulness, enduring commitment. And the covenant of a marriage stands like a divine sentinel over marriage for blessing or for judgment. So what does the covenant look like? What does it look like? Look at Genesis 2.24. This is the basis of keeping a marriage together. This is the big picture. And in it, there's going to be three foundational truths that are so significant it says this, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You've heard that before. It's the I promise. So what is the deal with leaving? What's that about? It's called severance. Severance must take place because a change in priority in the relationship is about to take place. Why did they mention father and mother? 
Because that's supposed to be your most important relationship apart from God. It's supposed to be. It not always is. We understand that. But they use that as the most important relationship, earthly relationship. God says when you get married, the most important earthly relationship is not your mom and dad and your siblings and all your cousins or whatever. And by the way, it's not your job. And it's not the hunting trips. It's not your favorite NFL team. The most important thing is that person you're bringing into your life. And you better make cuts with everything else. And if you're not willing to make cuts with all of that other stuff, don't get married. Don't make the other person miserable because they have to compete with the other things in your life. I look at this as the engagement. This is the engagement. When the person comes to that position in their life, where they said, I've looked at all the six billion, seven billion people on the planet Earth, <laughs> and I just want this one. I'm willing to sever all of that stuff for this one. That's when the engagement takes place. You make that decision, right? You sever everything else for that one, including family. But here's the second thing you do. You cleave. Once, once that happens, you cleave to your wife. It says, a man shall cleave to his wife in order for the marriage to survive the storms of life. Each couple must again view that covenant of marriage as irrevocable, irrevocable, permanent bond. Don't you just uh, hear that thing ring in the ear about why people get divorced? We had irreconcilable differences. <laughs> no, you just couldn't communicate is what that's about. The Hebrew word for cleave means to glue or to cling. So when you get married, you become a Klingon. <laughs> I know it's getting late. You know, it's like, <laughs> you remember what God said, Jesus said, and was talking about marriage. This is what He said: What God has joined together, what? Let no man tear apart. Why so? Well, this is why so. All you got to do is, for an illustration, is get two pieces of paper. Put some glue on them, let it set until it's dried, and then take that paper apart. Perfectly apart, right? You know how it comes apart? How? In pieces. Talk to people who've been divorced. Ask them, how did it go? It was great. Couldn't be better. No. People's hearts have been ripped, right? And that's why God says, I hate divorce. For lots of reasons, but that's one of the reasons God hates divorce. When does the cleaving take place? At the wedding, when you make your vow. The engagement, the wedding, but then there's the marriage. This is the weaving part. They shall become what? One flesh. This definitely speaks about the physical intimacy of God. This is the license for physical intimacy. But it's much more than that. It's the whole human existence together. It's every facet that the couple joins life together, husband and wife, uniting together emotionally, intellectually, financially, and more important, listen, spiritually. But I want you to see what it says. They become, become one flesh. A process do you know that Jenny and I have been married for like 47 years or something like that, I think? <laughs> Thank you. I got it right. 47 years. You know what? We're still becoming one flesh. Still becoming, still discovering, still growing together in our relationship. You become, you not are, you become one flesh. This pattern for marriage, two people committing their lives together, for us is the first time, I want you to look at this carefully because this is awesome. The first time in scripture, the pattern on how we develop a relationship with Christ. You leave things from the world. You say, none of that satisfies me. I'm repenting. I'm turning to Christ. You cleave to Christ when you make that commitment to the gospel. You understand the gospel and you say, God, here I am. Save me. That's your vow. And then you what? You become one with Christ. Become one with Christ. It's that growth, that incredible thing that happens over time. Well, the chapter of man's crowning creation ends in verse 25. 
And it says this, they were naked, the bo both were naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Interesting passage. The word naked here is also a description of a tree opening its branches. You got to understand in this relationship right here, there were no barriers. There was transparency, open communication, full acceptance, trust, no fear, unrestrained acceptance. That is the perfect marriage, by the way, right there. There is one perfect marriage in the scripture. That's it right now up to this point. It changed later because of sin. But up to this point, this was the perfect marriage. They were not naked as we would consider nakedness, but they were clothed with something else. Why do I tell you that? Chapter 3 says... We were naked. We were, we were, were naked. Remember that? God's, let me turn this off. God is finding them out. Their sin is being found out. And he says, what's up? We're naked. God says, who said you were naked? So if, if they think they were naked, evidently they were clothed with something. So what do you think they were clothed with? Absolutely, the glory of God. The glory of God. The covering they lost when they sinned could very well be the glory of God, the robe of righteousness. Philippians 3.21 says, Our bodies may be fashioned like unto the glorious body of Christ. It was really the absence of sin that would have allowed them really to experience this incredible ecstasy. Can I tell you one day, one day, That'll return. Because Paul says this, being confident this very thing, he that began a good work will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. God's going to bring it around one day. Isaiah 61.10, excuse me, Romans 8.30 8, says, he who he justified, look what he says, them he also glorified. So the key for a successful marriage is not a husband and wife having a fulfilling physical relationship or meeting each other's emotional needs. Here it is. The key of a successful marriage is spiritual. Spiritual. Two people committed to their God and committed to a life of, listen, holiness. To a life of holiness. The creation ends with marriage. God bringing two people to live in paradise. We know because of man's sin that was disrupted. But listen, we also know what God intended to do. What God intended to do, he's going to accomplish. And he does as one day his new creation. Listen, he starts, he ends the first creation story with marriage. You know how he ends the second, the, the, the new creation <laughs> We're the marriage of the Lamb. Isn't that awesome? What God begins, he finishes. Nothing's going to thwart the plan of God. Nothing. God says, here's where I started, and I'm going to finish it just like that. Better yet, because we'll never have to make those choices of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It'll be done. Deal. Aren't you glad for that? I'm so thankful for that. So what's the moral of the story? What God intended for man from the beginning, he'll restore. But for now, but for now, you do your best and commit the rest to God, right? Yeah. That's it. Acabamos. We're done. <laughs> I hope. That maybe like that picture we showed for the beginning where some of you were very keen to seeing that word Jesus and some of you go, what in the world is that? But maybe there's a few things here in this story where a little bit of an insight. But, but there's purpose. I want you to see how Genesis just is, is revealed in the New Testament. It's, it's all what linked together, right? It's just revealed. You just see it. Man, it's just in, this story just absolutely floors me. It does. Everything you need to know about the scripture is found in the first probably four chapters of Genesis. If you really learn the four chapters of Genesis, you're going to know pretty much everything about the scripture. All the principles of scripture are in the first four 
four chapters. Anyway, may God bless you and keep you and absolutely bless you. And we look forward to Sunday as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I kind of encourage you um, on this whole idea of fasting. Uh, implement into your life. And I realize there may be some of you who, because of physical reasons, you can't do it. That's okay. Don't, that's, we're not here to put any pressure on anyone. But the church here takes serious the needs that we see before us. And we understand from Scripture, we're looking at the Scripture model. There are, t there are times in, in the life of God's people when certain things came up that were so significant that they put aside the physical need and really turn to God spiritually, just spend time with God and say, God, here's what's going on, God. We just need to hear from you. So please, if you can, uh, as a church body, we'd really appreciate that. Anyway, we will look forward to our time together on Wednesday. God bless you. It's good to see you all. And don't forget, you are the choir on Sunday. <laughs>